There was a recent Whitney Houston documentary that came out, I think like two years ago or so, and her brother mentions in it that she was named after actress Whitney Blake, who lived here. Whitney was born just a few neighborhoods away in Eagle Rock in 1926. Her dad was a Secret Service agent for President Woodrow Wilson, and she began acting at the Pasadena Playhouse before getting television work. Whitney's first marriage produced three children, and her second marriage was to her agent and manager, Jack Fields, who produced an entirely new image for her. Jack was not an attractive man, but he was six feet tall, distinguished looking. Most important, he believed in Whitney enough to orchestrate for her a Hollywood-style makeover. He had her lighten her dark hair blonde. As I saw one day in the second grade when she came to pick me up, her hair was curled, she was wearing high heels and a tight gray pencil skirt, and there was a big bandage over the center of her face. The transformation from regular pretty girl to dazzling ingenue was complete. I never knew a mink from a sable or seal, ponies from reed, oh, look at me now. A year after they met, Whitney and Jack were married, and we moved from our small South Pasadena bungalow on Indiana Avenue to a ritzy, for us, split-level hillside house at 6722 Whitley Terrace in the Hollywood Hills. It was unbelievable. We walked into the upstairs. In our new house, the master bedroom, kitchen, and dining room were on the top floor, and the kids' bedrooms and an elegant all-white living room and bar were downstairs. There was a big, sloped terrace yard and a view of the Hollywood Bowl parking lot. I remember my brothers and I went crazy when we first moved in, running up and down the yard steps, hiding in bushes, racing around the house, and getting lost. It was so much grander than the modest house we'd come from. She even landed a starring role as the wife and mother on the hit TV show Hazel for four seasons, and it's this show where Whitney Houston's mom got the idea to name her daughter Whitney. Now, Hazel, if Mr. Baxter says he'll act as your attorney, he will. Won't you, George? Dorothy! All right, Hazel. Her acting career slowed down, and she married her final husband, Alan Mannings, in 1968. And not only would they stay married for over 30 years, but together they created one of the most iconic TV shows of all time that's still changing people's lives. This is it. This is it. This is life. I don't know, I just love that this glamorous, Kim Novak-looking TV star created this show about a strong single mom raising Mackenzie Phillips and Valerie Bertinelli, but she actually lived it for a while. But we are not done with the television legacy. It does not end there. Whitney's daughter Meredith grew up to be a television icon in her own right, and one who I was raised on. Of course I'm going to let you know that I met Meredith Baxter once. She is just the loveliest woman and has given me years and years of just fantastic television entertainment. All right, this is kind of one of the best portions of Whitley Heights that really showcases that, you know, Mediterranean lifestyle that H.J. Whitley had in mind when he developed this area. Also, you can see just a snippet of the Hollywood freeway that wasn't here during the time of, you know, Barbara Lamar and Marion Davies and all them, but eventually would come plowing through in the 50s. But we're going to talk about that in a little bit. We'll come back up and finish Whitley Terrace, but first we're going to mosey down Milner Road and take a look at some fun old houses. Here's a great one with probably just a terrible view. I'm going to tell you a success story about an actress that just doesn't happen enough in Hollywood. In fact, she bought this house as a result of her fame. Marie Dressler was born in Canada, 1868, and at age 14, she left home and traveled across America acting in various theaters, eventually landing roles on Broadway. 
In 1914, at the age of 44, she starred in her very first film, which also happened to be the very first full-length comedy film, directed by none other than Max Sennett. She cast Charlie Chaplin as her leading man, giving him his very first break. She made a few more silent films, and then did some theater, took a long trip to Europe, and when she returned, found it almost impossible to get work in the youth-obsessed show business. She was broke, and ended up sharing a hotel room apartment with a friend. In 1927, at the age of 59, she had the nerve to leave New York City and return to Hollywood to try film acting again, and ends up having an astronomical string of hits, making her the top box office star two years in a row. Not even they can stop me now Will I be flying overhead? The success of all of her comedy films allowed her to buy this house, which is rumored to have the very first pool in Whitley Heights, and when a reporter asked if she used it, she said, I've already given the world enough laughs. American dreams came to somehow. I swore I'd chase until I was dead. In 1934, at the age of 65, her comeback came to an end when she died of cancer. And although I've never been there, I hear that Canada has a museum that is dedicated to Marie Dressler. I was reading a book the other day. Reading a book? Yes, it's all about civilization or something. A nutty kind of a book. Oh. Do you know that the guy says that machinery is going to take the place of every profession? Oh, my dear. That's something you need never worry about. All right, well, we're gonna walk down to this magical little, I don't know exactly what it's called, a nook, a cul-de-sac. It just kind of dead ends into like a courtyard of houses and it's called Watsonia Terrace. Most people would probably get a bigger thrill knowing that Nobel Prize winning author William Faulkner lived here when he came to Hollywood from Mississippi to write screenplays. But my big thrill comes from knowing that Gloria Swanson lived here, and not only did she live here, but she lived here while filming, in my opinion, probably the greatest screen performance of all time. What's the matter, dear? Nothing. I just didn't realize what it would be like to come back to the old studio. I had no idea how much I missed it. We've missed you too, dear. We'll be working again, won't we, Chief? We'll make our greatest picture. It'll be a very expensive picture. Oh, I don't care about the money. I just want to work again. You don't know what it means to know that you want me. Well, nothing would please me more, Norma, if... if it were possible. And remember, darling, I don't work before 10 in the morning and never after 4.30 in the afternoon. She, of course, was a huge silent film star and survived the invention of sound, but left Hollywood in 1938 for New York. Then in 1950, lightning struck when she was cast as an aging silent film star in the flawless Sunset Boulevard. 
She almost didn't get the part. Mae West, Norma Shear, Greta Garbo, and Mary Pickford were all considered, and when Gloria was asked to do a screen test, she was really offended, but thank God her good friend George Cukor pushed her to do one because she did and won the role. You know, I just need to do an entire walking tour on her someday because her life was just insanely rich with stories and she just rented this place while she filmed the movie, but she once had this Beverly Hills mansion that was off the charts. It's not lost on me that she rented this house in Whitley Heights, the old stomping ground for silent film stars, and that energy just had to feed into her phenomenal performance that should have won the Oscar, by the way. If you told me that I could pick any house in Whitley Heights to, I don't know, stay in for a week, I would pick this one. And I don't even really know why, but there's just something so commanding about it. And of course the history is fun. This was home to a very interesting Hollywood couple. Adrian, as he was simply known, was a costumer, gay, a lot of people knew it, and Janet Gaynor, rumored to be a lesbian, was 22 when she became Hollywood's very first Best Actress Oscar winner. Janet retired in 1939 at the age of 33 <laughs> and married Adrian and they moved into this house. Now, they didn't live here for their entire marriage, but they did have a child together. Adrian definitely would have won Oscars, but the costume category wasn't in play during his lifetime. He essentially quit movies and opened his own store in Beverly Hills, being one of the first Hollywood costumers to do so, and died in 1959 of a heart attack at age 56. Janet eventually remarried to a man and returned to acting, mostly doing television and theater, and in 1971, she made her Broadway debut in Harold and Maude. In 1982, she was visiting San Francisco when a drunk driver hit the taxi that she and her friend, actress Mary Martin, were in. She died from complications of the accident two years later in 1984. Actresses Mary Martin and Janet Gaynor tonight. Both of them were in a car accident in San Francisco last night. They were taking a taxi to dinner in Chinatown when the police say a van ran through a red light and hit their car broadside. Well, how about this little precious dollhouse? William Wellman, who directed Janet in A Star Is Born, lived here. He also directed Wings, the very first Best Picture winner. It was also home to Ida Coverman. Ida, oh, thank God that name's gone. Uh, she was Louis B. Mayer's executive secretary, who eventually became head of PR for MGM. 
Ida, ugh, gross, pops up anytime there's a story shown about Judy Garland. She's responsible for MGM's School for Young Stars, where Judy attended with Mickey Rooney. Liz Taylor went there, Clark Gable, and Jean Parker, who I talked about earlier in the tour. Okay, two fun women lived here, not together. First is Lenore Coffey. Now that's a great name. She wrote stories mostly about her experiences being a female writer and was even Oscar nominated for Best Adapted Screenplays. And then a classically trained theater actress named Irene Tidro, who broke into television much later in life, also lived here. And I remember seeing her all the time in reruns I watched growing up. I feel like telling you what I remember her from and I'm not even looking them up. I know that she was a nun in Charlie's Angels, and she was on the Facts of Life in Different Strokes, but I really remember her so well, for some reason, from Three's Company. <laughs> Lenore has a really great quote regarding Hollywood that I love. I know I should just show it, but I like saying it. They pick your brains, break your heart, and ruin your digestion. And what do you get for it? Nothing but a lousy fortune. <laughs> Can't relate, but so good. She wrote a handful of popular movies, some with people I've mentioned on this tour. I mean, that's the thing. You've probably picked up on it, but back then in this neighborhood, everyone was connected. Like, you didn't even need Kevin Bacon. Everyone is connected by, like, one degree. All right, back up on the part of Whitley Terrace where we left off in front of the Whitney Blake Meredith Baxter house, but really just another great example of that Mediterranean vibe that H.J. Whitley was going for. Hobart started the entire idea over here of building houses into hillsides. I mean, they had to figure out grading systems for the road and retaining walls. I mean, now everywhere you look, there is a hillside neighborhood in Los Angeles. Whitley Terrace breaks off into a little loop called Wedgwood Place, which we're going to actually come back and start right here. But first, I'm going to show you where we're going to pop out since I'm pretty much covering every inch of this neighborhood. So down there, is, we're facing south towards Hollywood, if anyone cares, is where Wedgwood Place spills out, but we're going to go back and start from the beginning. I'm going to make this loop pretty much just visual. I'll point out people who lived here, but there aren't really that many exciting stories, and the most famous person who lived here was W.C. Fields, and oh, I couldn't imagine making you look at more than one picture of him. Ugh.
It's pretty obvious that most of the homes in Whitley Heights have been extremely well preserved, keeping all of the original charm. And then there's this, which I, I, I don't even know what, I mean, uh, I don't know what it is. It's just, it's, no, it's offensive. Uh. Even though it's bright and I have to squint, I have been walking forever and I need to sit down. So I'm going to tell you the next part of this story against this wall with a pretty background, sort of, minus the rust. So I live in the Beechwood Canyon area of Hollywood, which is just one or two neighborhoods east of Whitley Heights. And this all used to be one giant neighborhood until the 101 freeway was built, completely dividing it. That's why it's so noisy, by the way. That's the freeway you hear. Uh, it's been around forever, but they added a portion of it from Hollywood through the Coanga Pass, basically connecting the San Fernando Valley to Los Angeles. In order to do so, they had to destroy dozens of homes and properties, and whenever you read articles or books or anything about Whitley Heights, they always mention Charlie Chaplin, Rudolph Valentino, and Harold Lloyd. Ironically, their homes don't exist anymore. <laughs> Rudolph Valentino was one of the very first stars to live here. In fact, he was one of the big drawing points for other silent film stars because he was so hugely successful and the rest of them thought, why not live in the same neighborhood? Valentino was arguably the biggest, greatest, most well-known silent film star of all time. So much so that when he died, over 100,000 people attended his funeral and some of his fans even committed suicide. So weird. I'm not gonna go into his whole story, mostly because he only lived in the house that doesn't even exist anyway for two years and he moved to a much greater house in Beverly Hills that I'll have to cover at a another time. He lived in the house with his wife, wink wink, actress Natasha Rambova, and she, well actually, she is the one who discovered costume designer Adrian and brought him to Hollywood for one of her movies. The house wasn't big enough for Natasha, plus fans were coming up and down the street all the time trying to get a glimpse of their matinee idol, so they moved out in the late 20s and then Thomas Lyle Williams moved in. Thomas was born in Kentucky in 1896 and at age 16 got married and had a kid. The marriage lasted for like two years and then he moved to Chicago in 1915. Thomas's sister used to take Vaseline. She would add charcoal to it and darken her eyelashes. And one day Thomas, with the help of a chemistry set, developed a product that he named after his sister Mabel. <laughs> now like 1915 in Chicago and Thomas meets a man named Emery Shaver who works in advertising and they fall in love and begin a relationship which is why his marriage never worked maybe he was born with it 
Ugh, I had to. So Maybelline was doing very well, and the two men had a lot of money, started dressing impeccably, driving flashy cars, and people started questioning them, and they decided they wanted to leave the Midwest and go somewhere where they would fit in. Hollywood. With Valentino now living in Beverly Hills, the house is available, so Thomas and Emery buy it and move in. Not only do they live here, but they use it as Maybelline's West Coast headquarters. You showed me how to do exactly what you do, how I fell in love with you. Oh, oh it's true. Oh, I love you. You showed me how to say exactly what you say in that very special way. Oh, oh it's true. You fell for me too. Earlier in the tour, I mentioned that actress Viola Dana was one of the very first Maybelline models, and that is because Emery was a genius and came up with the idea to use film stars to advertise the cosmetics. Here's how big Valentino was. In the mid-40s, the men decided to renovate the house, and when word got out, they had to hire armed guards because fans tried to steal pieces of the property knowing that Valentino once lived here. The irony for me is I'd much rather hear the stories from the Maybelline years. I mean, this couple were, they were amazing and hanging out with some of the greatest stars of all time and had just incredible parties here. But those parties came to an end a few years later when the freeway was built and the two men ended up moving to Bel Air. They were together for 50 years and they're both buried together at the Forest Lawn Cemetery in Glendale. You know, it's really fun to glamorize the, well, all of Hollywood actually, but especially the golden age, the 30s and 40s. But the truth is it was really only magical if you were white and heterosexual. Everyone else, best of luck. Taught it to me too Exactly what you do And now you love me I've mentioned in other tours of mine that I don't like to point out where current celebrities live. I mean, privacy issues, the whole thing's just weird to me, but since she sold it and moved out just a few months ago, I'll tell you that Busy Phillips used to live here. The house was built in 1923 and has like five or six bedrooms. It has a pool, a spa. You can Google it and look online. The pictures inside are really amazing. Great, great, great piece of property. All right, we are right back where we began on the Whitley Terrace loop. Completed the entire loop, but we are not done yet. We still have to check out Grace Avenue and so much more of Whitley Heights.